Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm really pleased to have Patrick Highsmith with me once again. This time he is here to talk about Timberline Resources. He was uh, with us in January to talk about this company. It is a company with a story, an involving exploration story. I think it's very exciting. It's the Eureka Project in Nevada. It's a Carlin-style target that is um, really starting to show some some great results uh, just recently with some assays, and Patrick will talk to us about that momentarily before I say hello to Patrick. I should tell you that the stock trades in the United States under the symbol TLRS. Uh, TBR is a symbol in Canada, 139.7 million shares at around around U.S. 29 cents, I believe, is the latest number I've seen. That gives it a market cap, a really small market cap, which I think is very exciting given what I think this company might be on to, $40 million in U.S. money, something like that. A uh, company does have a small resource, a lower-grade um, surface resource, uh, but uh, clearly – uh, Timberline is on to something, it seems to me, much more exciting. So I'm really happy to say hello to Patrick. Thanks for joining me, Patrick. Well, hello to you as well, Jay. It's great to be here. Thank you. It's really good to have you here, especially looking at some of the exciting numbers that were published uh, in February and a couple more in March of this year. Really exciting. Um, yeah, we first talked to you, I think it was back in January. Well, maybe for the for the sake of those who aren't familiar, might not have heard your initial uh, interview on this on this program. Give our listeners just a sense of the project and and what you're uh, what you're looking to do there. Well, Jay, the Eureka Project is a large uh, land position on the Battle Mountain Eureka Trend mm-hmm. in Nevada. We have neighbors who are making gold, uh, McEwen Mining to the north, Caliber Mining to the southeast. We also have I eighty Gold as a neighbor in this active district. Eureka is a, a famous district, uh, Jay, because it was uh, one of the larger silver producers in the late 1800s, and that's how it got its name. And it's now about a 10 million ounce and growing Carlin-type district in which uh, Timberline is the largest uh, claim and tenement owner uh, in the district. Um, so uh, it's an exploration project to be sure. But we do have that sort of foundational resource that you mentioned, which was first reported in a a technical report in Canada in 2013 with that uh, half a million ounces in the measured and indicated category, Mm -hmm. but at a comparatively low grade of 0.62 grams per ton. But, of course, some of that is oxide, and as you say, it comes to the surface. So there's potential in that resource, but we've been exploring – uh, to the east of that, Jay, sort of adjacent to it, and we've been drilling much higher grades in a new discovery area we call the water well zone. Uh, okay, well, let's, I guess those are where that's where those high grade numbers have come out uh, from uh, water well. Um, February twenty fourth, twenty two point nine meters, grading six point one one grams per ton gold. Uh, March 9th, 41.1 meters of five, a little over five grams of gold per ton. And then the latest one was March 24th, 44.2 meters, grading 4.1 grams of gold per ton. Are you really seeing sort of a Carlin-style mineralization with these intercepts? Jay, at Eureka, we, we've confirmed over the years that this is a Carlin-type system. And, in mm-hmm. fact, there are multiple prospects where, where we've drilled gold. And, of course, with the resources at a place called Lookout Mountain. We're mm-hmm. just east of that now. Across the valley, a kilometer and a half away, is another target called Oswego, where we've also identified Carlin-type gold. Now, that means we're going to see rocks like limestones, shales, dolomites. These are sedimentary rocks. And uh, the mineralization will often be uh, sort of typical of a Carlin-type mineralization is you can't see the gold. It's so-called no see gold. Mm-hmm. But it's associated with things you can see like arsenic minerals or pyrite. Um, and uh, it does come to surface. And as it gets deeper down, very often we see a sulfide style of mineralization sort of beneath the oxide mineralization that the uh, the district was first noted for. So definitely Carlin-type mineralization. And uh, these thicknesses and grades, uh, Jay, they have – we have seen some of these similar grade and, and thicknesses uh, in the earlier days of the delineation of the lookout uh, resource back in 2005 and 2006. The company Staccato Gold, whom we acquired in 2010 – had drilled some really good intercepts. When I was at Newmont Mining, we looked at the, that project back in those days, noted the good grades and thicknesses then, but then, uh, you know, just sort of got away from that high grade zone. And, and now we've identified a new higher grade zone, which is outside of the resource. This would be an addition mm-hmm. if we're successful in proving this up, Jay, mm-hmm. right next to the old resource. And as you pointed out, 
we've now had two core holes that have passed through thicknesses over 40 meters, mm-hmm. are continuously mineralized with, with higher grade pockets within them. Mm-hmm. Uh, such as, you know, like you pointed out, uh, one hole was uh, over 12 meters at, at 9.18 grams per ton. Mm-hmm. We're super excited about that. And, of course, the best hole yet drilled is, is also the southernmost hole in the water well zone. We announced this in early March, uh, hole 212C. And uh, within that 41-meter interval of 5 grams, we actually ripped into a zone that was 19.8 meters of 9.5 grams. So, mm. so really good high-grade stuff. Uh, Jay, and, and it seems to be hanging together. Mm-hmm. That, that's really the best news, Jay, is we've drilled at the far north end. We hit a high-grade interval that we've mentioned already. And now at the far south end, over 400 meters away, we've hit this 40-meter interval of, of over 5 grams with higher grade within it. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, every time we've drilled this horizon, which is at the base of a unit called the Dunderberg Shale, mm-hmm. every time we hit it, there's gold there, Jay. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes it's not economic thickness. But these intervals are very likely to be economic grade and width. And uh, really, the interval's wide open to the south uh, for over a kilometer and a half, a lot of potential there. And on the north as well, uh, we have this higher grade zone, wide open to the north and northwest. So uh, we're faced with the opportunity to both sort of fill in and sort of start to drill this shape out. You know, it now has a footprint. We can kind of predict it. But we also have the opportunity to do the exciting exploration around these high grade holes and see where it goes from here, you know, to the north and south and east and west. So uh so that's what happens in the early days of a discovery. We're, we're looking to see its footprint, and then we'll fill in that footprint and, and grow it. That's mm-hmm. that's the objective now. Uh, so you'll be doing, I guess, step-out drilling if, if you want to, along the structure that you've identified so far? Yes, exactly. It's it's complicated. I mean, these Carlin-type deposits are uh, are just shattered with faults and mm-hmm. fractures, and those faults are the plumbing, Jay, and, yeah. and that's... Uh, that's the other aspect of this recent news release I'll mention in just a minute. But so, so picture these cracks in the Earth's crust that have been the plumbing for getting these fluids in here. Mm-hmm. And when we hit high grade intercepts, I mean, 19.8 meters and 9.5 grams <laughs> with, with assays up to 25 grams in there, you're definitely going to want to do step outs around that pretty close to uh-huh. really nail down the high grade. Okay, so that's one aspect of what we're going to do. And that means you might be drilling near a fault, and that'll just jumble things up, and, mm-hmm. and we'll have to drill more holes to figure out exactly where it goes. Mm-hmm. But um, but th- but those are the signs of a robust system, right? You get lots of these faults and that plumbing. And so we'll eventually we'll be chasing that to depth as well, because some of these faults can be so-called feeder zones or, mm-hmm. or the, the channels in which the highest grade are likely to be found. And and, and I guess that brings up the other aspect of this recent news release, Jay, which is that we, we had this huge geophysical anomaly just mm-hmm. east of this resource. Mm-hmm. And on the one side of it, where we're working now, we have the water well zone and the lookout resource before that. But on the other side of this IP anomaly, we have that showing called Oswego, mm-hmm. where we've hit some surface gold and we're still waiting on assays from a few drill holes. So right in the middle was this geophysical anomaly that suggested the rocks uh, were, were chargeable. They had electrical properties that mm-hmm. might indicate the presence of pyrite or maybe mm-hmm. graphite. Mm-hmm. And we needed to drill test that thing. And that's a real exploration hole. And we reported that hole. And it was uh, it was hole number 206. And, you know, you read through it in the press release and we describe a lot of geology and we describe some low-grade gold and silver numbers over significant widths, though, mm-hmm. Jay. So what we've now learned is that that IP anomaly appears to be a, a real feature that we can see in the rock. We've drilled down there. We hit an intrusive rock. Think of it as like a granite, mm-hmm. uh, a very fine-grained granite. It's mm-hmm. been shattered with alteration. Uh, it, it's sort of bleached out. It kind of turned to clay in places. And there's lots of pyrite in it, mm-hmm. Jay, and around mm-hmm. the pyrite, uh, we also found this low level of gold and silver, mm-hmm. and with that, and with that much silver, we can say pretty categorically that this intrusive is an older type of mineralization mm-hmm. uh, that was uh, that actually was responsible for making the Eureka District famous with all that silver lead zinc production. Mm-hmm. But there is gold there as well, and we believe that the same channel, the same plumbing uh, that that intrusive followed up into these rocks, mm-hmm. could also be followed by the later. Carlin type mineralization. Mm-hmm. And this is just an earmark, Jay, of these great Carlin type districts in Nevada. They have multiple uh, generations of mineralization. So here you have older lead zinc silver, mm-hmm. uh, may or may not be of economic significance, mm-hmm. but 
The Carlin trend has older silver lead zinc mineralization as well, followed by the Carlin type gold later. Mm -hmm. So does the, the Archimedes mine north of us that I-80 gold is exploring. We know we have the older silver lead zinc overprinted by the younger Carlin type. And quite frankly, that, that, that silver lead zinc mineralization may also have prepared the rock to make it even a better host rock for when the Carlin type stuff came later. So it's mostly a geological story. We put some pretty pictures in the news release, Jay, to try yeah. to explain it to people uh -huh. in, in three dimensions. We're super excited about it because we just think it opens up a lot more potential getting a little bit deeper. And uh, and in that area, we, like I said, we've got high grade just 300 meters away to the west in mm -hmm. hole 220C. Mm -hmm. So you got high grade over there and kind of a – a feeder structure down and, and an IP geophysical anomaly that we now have validated to be something real that needs, guess what, more exploration. So that uh, that anomaly, that intrusion, I guess, it, it divides the Oswego from the Lookout Mountain, if I understand properly, may or may not have economic value, but will you be, I guess, focused mostly on the Carlin style, like the water well, that, and the Oswego, those areas first and foremost, or will you be putting some deep holes down into the uh, into the intrusion? Well, we're, we're absolutely going to focus and step out on these known high-grade showings sure, that need sure. delineation and what have you, um, but you know, our, our mutual friend, Quentin Henney, uh, boy, he can't wait to see some deep holes in that, I know. <laughs> uh, that area, Jay. And we love that, of course. Um, and in Nevada, of course, there are deep underground mines mining very high-grade material. That potential is always there. But really, if you look at it in one of our cross-sections there in the press release, mm -hmm. the symmetry is kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. we, we've hatchered in red some of the potential areas that we'll be drilling for gold around this thing. And and, and that symmetry sort of says, well, there's, there's a system here, and it's wide now. It's, you know, it's over a kilometer and a half wide. This anomaly is over two kilometers long. So in that huge volume, we could fit a lot of gold. And uh, if there happens to be some high-grade silver lead zinc down there, well, fantastic. We'll, yeah. we'll drill that too. But, uh, but yeah, it's about really the, how this system got here and what its shape is and where are the sweet spots within it, Jay. How well-funded are you, and, and can you talk a little bit about your drill program going forward? You know, we've uh, there's been a great response to this news, Jay, and we're in a much stronger position with our share capital than we have been. It was interesting. Our drill program went into the fall and winter instead of the summer, so mm -hmm. our news flow didn't really begin until February, as, mm -hmm. you, as you said. So we had these sort of doldrums, and we're really happy to see the share prices moved up. The budget of last year's program and, our, and Steve Steve Osterberg, our VP exploration, his delivery of that was fantastic. We came in under budget. So our goal was to leave a million U.S. in the bank when we were done with all this work. And we've, we've more than done that. And we also have some warrants that are in the money that are being exercised now. And so that means our treasury is, is fine for this interim period before we start drilling again. No need to finance immediately. And we've gotten the share price to a much better position to finance. But we are planning a robust program, Jay. And quite frankly, let's just say we're preparing multiple budgets for sort of multiple scenarios. Um, but one of the first things we'll be doing is a little bit of core drilling to sort of confirm these, uh, these high-grade intercepts compared to some previous reverse circulation drilling that we've done in the area which returned lower grades. Right. So we're going to investigate that a little bit more. The core drilling seems to be yielding much better grades than the RC, and we want to confirm that a little bit and queue up a sizable program uh, for the summer and into the fall, too. But probably that would require a financing. And, of course, uh, we don't spend money we don't have, so uh, we're, we're really happy to see the market embracing this news, and we probably do have some work ahead of us here to cash up before we drill uh, a big program. Yeah, I think it's important for and people listening to this program to know that management has skin in the game. I think I saw, Patrick, something like 20% or so of the shares are held by management. Does that sound right? Yeah, board and management together mm -hmm. um, is a little over 20%, I believe. Prescott Capital is our is our next biggest shareholder. They're somewhere in the teens. They're a significant shareholder, maybe 13 or 15%, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and very supportive uh, shareholder as well. So, yeah, the, you know, Timberline's been around for a long time, and and uh, they got financed through this downturn, and, and Bill Batlack, one of our directors, was a, a big supporter uh, and financier of the company, and that's one way the board accumulated so many shares. So we've definitely got 
a skin in the game here and a team that's committed to uh, to realizing what we think will be a big discovery in the Eureka District. Boy, it sure looks promising. I'm excited about it, and I must say it is, a, of course, a recommendation in my newsletter. I own shares personally. It is a sponsor to this show, and I'm really proud to, to have it as such. Uh, anything else, Patrick, before we wrap it up today? Well, I just want to say stay tuned. We've got uh, one more round of drill results to come that will oh, okay. come in April. Mm-hmm. Uh, boy, the labs are busy, as you know, Jay, and yeah. some of those didn't get in the lab till February. So we'll have assays in April on the Oswego zone, which we had a great press release about in December. So stay tuned to that and, and look forward to our plans. We expect to be very active in Eureka. And, of course, what a great place. Uh, if you're going to find high-grade gold, and uh, even if it's sulfide mineralization like this, Jay, if you're going to find high-grade gold, uh, Nevada is a great place to do it. Absolutely. The infrastructure is there. Um, Patrick, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for being with us today and explaining this story, and we'll look forward to it uh, to more good drill results in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jake.